Brandy Larson is an amazing um, contact for those of you that are looking to break into publishing. So I am going to let her introduce herself a little bit more and tell you about her amazing book that is out there in the world. So please give a very warm welcome to Brandy Larson. Hi, everyone. I'm really glad you're here. I'm Brandy Larson, as Erin said. Uh, we're here for Create Your Own Query Letter. Um, so thank you for those in the room. There's also folks who are listening at home via the live stream. Hello, hello. Uh, and here's a little bit about me. So if you want to contact me, I'm at Brandy Larson on all the social things. Uh, you're welcome to tag me. Uh, my email is b at brandylarson.com. I'm a writer, I'm a speaker, and I'm a coach. Uh, I've been on both sides of the desk. So as a writer, uh, I'm the co-author on Uncultured, which is Daniela Mesternick Young's memoir and the story of her life. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. It's been, uh, we got to live the dream. Uh, it's been recommended by the New York Times twice, including last Sunday, uh, again, which is pretty fun. Uh, starred reviewed in Publishers Weekly and Book Page, Good uh, Reader's Choice, Best Book uh, nominee for memoir. Um, and it just came out, it came out in hardcover in 2022 and came out in paperback at the start of November. So that's me on the writing side of the desk. And then I was also uh, an executive at Penguin Random House uh, for, uh, for publishing. And so I, I was the director of, um, I was the digital publisher director uh, for NAL Berkeley, which are two imprints at Penguin Adult. And then I went on to uh, help all of Penguin Adult. And then I went on to lead publishing for North America for DK. Here's uh, a few of the books that I had the joy of working on and authors I've worked with. So you can see there's a lot of, uh, of fiction and nonfiction, a really healthy, fun mix. Um, and the reason I give you like, oh, here are these books that I've worked on, is that when you're taking advice from someone, understand who you're taking advice from and if that fits into the work that you have in front of you. That goes when you're getting feedback. It goes uh, when, you're, when you're seeking out writing advice. Today, we're going to talk about query letters, how to do them, what's going to happen with them. So I'm going to uh, first show you um, the elements of a query. I'm going to tell you what good looks like. We're going to, um, we're going to play uh, together as a group uh, and do some pitching. Uh, if we get there, um, we'll do comps, proposals, and agents. Erin, how much time is this presentation? Wow. Right on. We're probably going to get there. Uh, and there's going to be room for your questions uh, as well. Um, I am totally enamored um, with this little creature here. Uh, who knows what this creature is and can find it in this library? It is an opossum. It's an AADL opossum. And so I challenge you to find this creature in this very building, because it is here, and it's super fun. Uh, and so I have borrowed this opossum, and you'll see it uh, throughout, because I think that publishing could be a really joyful thing. Like, how many of us are alive because of books, right? Yeah. Um, and so we can play is why I'm trying to set the stage. Uh, before we jump into everything in the room, tell me uh, uh, if where you are in the publishing process. Are you, um, you have a finished manuscript, raise your hand. Right on. OK. Um, you are here because it's a rainy Sunday and you've got nothing better to do. Also cool. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, shout out for me if you're writing fiction or non. OK, shout out your genre. OK, so I'm hearing literary, middle grade fantasy, dystopia, horror. Yeah? Right on. We're going to have fun. OK. So we have this dream about what our manuscript is. Come on in. Um, it's this lovely baby that we've created on our rooms and maybe with our writing group. And we feel warm and fuzzy. And one day we'll walk into a bookstore and we'll see like an intergenerational collage of people who are reading and moved by our books uh, that will one day be a book, but right now it's just like pages in our computer. And that's like our dream of what we're doing when we're writing. And it is true that's what we're doing when we're writing. But when we're publishing, this is like an elephant in a fluorescent room, right? Our baby is not our baby. Our manuscript is our product. And our query letter is our sales pitch. And so 
I just want us to just change our mind view from like, we're happy writers and we've created this great art, to we are talking about commerce, we are talking about a resume, we are talking about a product. Okay? So we're, I'm going to level set because the way that books come into the world is through P&Ls, which is a profit and loss sheet, and a query letter that is the first moment of this game of telephone all the way down to the reader that tells people why, you should, why they should buy your book. So I think that, and you'll see in my examples, that you can do a uh, query letter in longer, but you can do a query letter in three paragraphs. The first paragraph you're explaining why them? The second paragraph is the strong pitch, what it is, realistic comps, and why now. If you're like, I've never heard the word comp before, don't worry, I've got you. Uh, we're going to talk about that. And then the last little bit is why you. Right? That's it. Your whole, the whole point of a query letter is to get someone to go, ooh, I want to read more. That's what it's supposed to do. And so if it does that, it wins. Right? Uh, there's lots of other things that'll happen down the line in the chain of publishing, but your query letter is really designed for someone to lean in and want to know more. I'm going to talk a little bit about one way in to do a strong pitch. There's lots of ways that you can describe your book that make sense for you, but this is an avenue that I've seen and that I really like. And so, the who, the what, and the twist, right? Who, what, twist. And so when someone, this will help you both when someone's like, oh, you're writing a book? What's your book about? And you're like, oh, I don't know, it's, oh, it's about that, right? Like when you're freaking out on that part. So this is going to help you right now uh, not freak out, right? Because you can, using this little formula, who, what, and twist. So let me give you an example with The Martian, right? Uh, the who is an astronaut. The what, he walked on Mars. The twist, he got stuck on the planet alone and he must use in his ingenuity to survive. It's a little bit of a longer twist, right? But you like, oh yeah, I understand what this is about, right? And I can start to think about other books that are kind of like that. Oh, I know it's science fiction. Oh, I know it's gonna be action-y. Oh, I know that it's going to have a hero that I appreciate, right? You start to get like not only what is this book about, but where does this book live? Um, the same with The Good Lord Bird, right? So um, The Good Lord Bird is literary fiction. It won the Innisfold Wolf Book Award uh, as well as the National Book Award. Um, it's a brilliant, beautiful book. What is it about? What? A young boy born a slave. Uh, who? A young boy born a slave. What? He joined John Brand's anti-slavery crusade. And twist, he must pass as a girl to survive, right? So there's a lot happening here. Right? I understand the time period, I understand like, what's happening, and I lean in and go, oh, I want to know that. Does the idea of who, what, twist, and a pitch sort of make sense as an introduction? We'll do it a little bit more. Uh, I mentioned uncultured, uh, and so when a book is published, uh, or about to be published, after it's been acquired by an editor, the first thing that they do is they publish a deal report in Publishers Marketplace. Publishers Marketplace is the newsletter that all the book people are reading, right? You know how every industry sort of has their own, um, their own newsletter. Publishers Marketplace is it. Uh, if you are starting to, when you're starting to query and want to get an understanding of the market, you can get a $25 a month subscription to Publishers Marketplace. You can see all the deals that are coming. It's how people get uh, understand what's coming and what's going and who's doing what in the industry. Um, for us, our, um, our book is about who, a woman born to the children of God cult, that's Daniela, what, she joined the army, the twist, she realized how much the two worlds mirror each other and help us understand what happens when harmful group mentality goes unrecognized, right? That's sort of the asterisk. So that was inside the way that we pitched the book and then it, it went to our agent, which then went to different editors, and then Hannah, our editor, uh, wrote this blurb. And you can see the, um, the yellow parts, right? Um, the who, like Daniela, um, Children of God cult, uh, the what? Military career and army intelligence, the twist. Two worlds marry each other, harmful group mentality goes unrecognized, right? Um, and so you can start to see it 
and it's going to make its way all the way through. This is the Kirkus review. Um, this is the starred review in book page. Uh, and you can see that, so inside, like once it went out into the world, we're still seeing the same language, right? It's the, the Debor memoir, and who, it's Danielle Mastanik Young. What is she doing? She's pondering not the differences between the cults, but their similarities, right? So the twist is right in there. Um, and, and what did she do? Uh, who is she? she? She grew up in a cult and she joined the US Army. Right? And so you can start to see that pitch makes its way all the way through. And a solid pitch, one that's really going to help you, that's going to define the book, is going to do that for you. Questions so far? OK, so we understand the elements of a query. right? It's got a pitch. It's got why you. It's got why them. Right? That's, that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to show you some right now to give you an idea of what good looks like. And these are actual queries that are out and successful in the world. Um, the first one I'm really excited about, um, I'm not allowed to tell you uh, the name of this book yet, because this book is about to be announced next week. And so I wish it was a week and I could say, oh my gosh, but I can tell you the author. And uh, so she's writing literary fiction. And she, uh, there's so many moments in publishing where it's really, really depressing. I'm going to give you really, really depressing uh, numbers later, I promise. Uh, but I want to start with some really exciting success stories. So she's a nurse. Uh, she does not have literary connections. Uh, she uh, was inspired by her editor's Instagram posts, right? And so she was, she was following this uh, very popular, brilliant editor on Instagram. And he called for unsolicited manuscripts, right? He called for queries. It normally doesn't happen that way, or it happens that way in like small doses. And so she created a query for him. And you can see um, that she's got his name. And she says, I was inspired and encouraged by the candor and passion of your Instagram video. I've heard many people in the industry talk about writing and none that challenge writers to find clarity about the purpose of writing, right? So she's explaining why him, uh, although uh, I would love for you to want to take on my debut novel. I am also wanted to sincerely thank you for that challenge. That is who this person is, right? Dana Renee Green is the author of this, and she, she is someone who is heartfelt. If that's part of who you are, like giving someone a thank you when they're doing a public call is a completely legitimate, good way to, to start something off. Uh, but you can really say, like, I'm attracted to you. I want to be a part of your stable because of the way you talk about this industry in a way that inspires me, right? So uh, it, it's a very interesting uh, why you. Here's the book. Um, so some big thing, I'm going to read it a little bit, and then I'm going to break down what's working. So the book falls under the genre of literary fiction. It's approximately 74,000 words. Uh, it was written with black women in mind as the primary audience. I expect many women will be able to connect to the story despite their backgrounds because of the universal traumas and joy in which all women find themselves. My novel brings forth the poor black women from South Carolina, loving the alcoholic husband that she won't leave, and the strong black female voice in Finding Me by Viola Davis. Because it's a memoir, it's akin to, Ren to Rennie uh, reflecting on her life and relationships in my novel. An American Marriage by Tyria Jones also shows a strong female narrative voice and digs into the thoughts and characters through the letters, much like mine. Um, so her, her book is an epistemal novel, right? It's told in letters, um, which she, she says here. Um, the things that like really make this work immediately, she says what genre it is, how long it is, uh, and who it's for. And she does that in sentence one, right? Um, just so you get an, an idea, a typical novel is around 80,000 words. When you're talking about uh, science fiction, that's like 110. Uh, the reason for that on the publishing side is it's uh, every, every, the amount of words uh, make up how many pages there are. There are 16 pages in what's called a signature, the, um, the way that paper is bound together. Every time you go over that word count, you have to add a signature. Adding a signature adds not just a uh, cost to the cost of ink, the cost of paper, the cost of shipping, but it also increases the cost of the book, which if you're a debut novelist, makes it really tricky for someone to go into a bookstore. Uh, the difference between a 1999 buy and a 1599 buy is a big difference when you're talking about paperback, right? So there's huge financial implications on why word count matters. If you show up with your debut novel and you tell them that it's 
40,000 or 140,000 words, you are immediately not going to be taken seriously. Right? My goal here is to arm you. It's about 80,000 words, right? If you're writing most commercial fiction. <clears throat> um, so she's putting that right up top, uh, immediately helps the, helps the person lean in, right? Our goal, all we want is for them to go, ooh, I want to know more, right? Um, so she's also saying, like, here's who's going to connect to this story, right? This is for black women. Right? But all women are going to get there because we understand the trauma. Right? Uh, she talks about they're from South Carolina. Right? And so this is a Southern book. Southern books have a very different, are able to be sold in a different way just because of the way the audience is. So she's understanding that. She, so you, we see two comps in here, and they're not really comps. Right? She calls out Finding Me by Viola Davis, um, which has the right voice but is in a different genre, right? It's not a literary fiction book, it's a memoir, and it's a celebrity memoir. And she's saying, I know this is a celebrity memoir, but also the tone is right. Like, imagine this tone, and then also this narrative, an American narrative, which is like a strong cup, right? And so she's saying, I understand the different seasonings that come in to make a book, a literary fiction book, that's gonna work in today's marketplace. Right? So she's sharing like how the books are similar to hers. She goes on to tell more about the book, which you I said three paragraphs, right? And so here's an extra paragraph where she's explaining why the book, like more about the book. You can do it or not do it. I really love that she explains like my grandmother died of breast cancer. My aunt in her 70s still remembers this. This is like a family story, the way her book is. Um, and so she says the novel's inspired by her story, right? And so she's giving a personal connection on here's why I'm writing this book. Here's why I'm interested in this story. And then she goes on to explain it. You don't need that, but that's what she winds up doing. And then here's the why her, right? Like This is a woman who knows she does not have credentials. Right? She wrote as a child. Uh, she went to the uh, Dreyfus School of the Arts, which is a public arts school in Florida, where I am also an alum. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree in nursing and a master's degree in social work. She's a hospice nurse. That's her day job. Um, she's worked as a nurse. Right? So she's saying, like, I'm not, there's not a stack of writing credentials here. Um, but I write about care, and I'm, and I'm writing about people, and here's my blog, which are based on my own interpretations. They're based on the same things I'm writing about in my book, um, and here's what I'm hoping to do. My mission as a writer is to write novels with a strong black female voice that tell stories outside of the stereotypical narratives, and it's to write nonfiction books that center around wholeness, healthy relationships, and mental health in the black community. Right? And so her social work and nursing community uh, uh, puts her in line to be able to speak to what her goal about nonfiction is. But she's being really clear of, you know, for an agent, like I'm pitching this book. I have two different kinds of interests. Here is what, what I've started to build in terms of my own writing and my own platform to try and make this. Yeah? So that's Dana Renee Green. Keep your eye out for her. Her book will come out in 2025. Um, and it's really, really, really good. <laughs> so. here's, uh, here's another literary fiction. So sometimes books come into the world because you meet people at a conference, um, right? Like there's lots of different ways. So Dana knew no one, code, like sent a thing on his Instagram, right? Through Instagram messages. Um, this, uh, she met someone at a conference. And so she says, hi, I hope you and yours are holding up well, all things considered. Uh, I'm writing to see if you have potential interest in my original unpublished novel, The Wives. Uh, the book's adult literary fiction and comes in at around 70,000 words. Possible comps include Garth Greenwell's Cleanness, Kristen Arnett's Mostly Dead Things, and Raven Liker's Lester. I'm reaching out to submit my material after you liked my pitch during DVP. Right? So she's being very clear, uh, right? She's, you know, there's like a kind of cutesy opening of I hope you're doing okay, right? Uh, Here's what I want from you. Here's my product, right? It's, it's called The Wives. It's adult literary fiction. It's 70,000 words. Here are like possible comps, right? She's just going straight to the meat of it, right? It's, it's pretty clear cut. 
Uh, Kristen Arnett, right, is a literary fiction author. Uh, she wrote Florida. She wrote a couple other things. So her stuff is weird, right? Like when you read it, like you're going to be like, oh, her stuff is kind of uh, like there's something kind of off about it, but it's like the great delicious kind of off, right? And the same with Lester. Um, and cleanness has a, a, this interesting cadence to it that is similar to her, to her work. Um, and she's giving the, the big line that says, I met you, you wanted my stuff. If that ever happens to you, please include that in your query letter. Um, and then she goes on to explain her book, right? In The Wives, and I want you to pay attention to this language because it's going to come back uh, even as, as you get to see it morph. In The Wives, Helen, a jittery copyright attorney and foot fetishist, courts a lesbian couple to date as her parents serve out plea deals after committing a rare and disturbing family crime. Right? This is a very specific book, right? And right, like, like, and, and she's clear up front of like, this is going to be, this is going to be, you know, something. Strap in. Helen compartmentalizes her life, the live streams of her feet, the calls from her parents, her dates, hard boundaries. And then she meets Catherine, a literary procedure professor, and her wife Katrina, a retired ballerina. And she falls for them. Her life implodes when one half simply follows her. And she visits her parents' victim, right? There's a lot going on here. And the way that literary fiction can carry off if it's done well, which she does. Um, the one person who can answer Helen's questions is the person she wants to see the least. Ooh, what does that mean, right? I'm leaning in. Um, when she finally confronts them face to face, she realized she's been asking the wrong questions all along, right? I saw some of you in the audience go, oh, <laughs> you know, and that's what it's trying to do. That, it, that is what it's trying to do. And then she says, here's my why me. I'm a journalist for a progressive news site, a 2022 DC Arts and Humanities grant recipient, Tin House Workshop Scholar, which in the literary world, like Tin House is a thing, um, Provost Town Fine Arts Work Center, Summer Fellow and Memoir, right? My nonfictions appeared in the rumpus and best American North fiction writing, right? Guernica, Salon, right? So she's got creds. Right? And she's not afraid to use them. And they're creds that make a difference in the literary world. Right? And so depending on what you're writing in, this is a good moment to say, start trying to get into your genre. Right? If you're writing horror, are you sending out to the horror lit mags? When you're writing um, dystopia, you know, are you writing? Are you inside that conversation? Do you know what's going on? Um, the, the word I wanted to call out here is I have pasted. So a lot of these queries, you're like literally pasting your work into an email. If you're like, oh God, that's horrible. It is, right? And the reason for it is because um, uh, agents are getting lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of queries. Um, not all of them are from parties who are like lovely writers who want them to get their work. Some of them are from like weird spammers who see their email address on the internet and would love to send them a virus or you know, the possibility of uh, you know, um, maybe help from a foreign country, right? And so um, that's why. And so when you're like, but how do I, you, know, you just told me that my, my, you know, my query letter is my sales pitch. How am I, how am I going to make my pitch look good? You're going to make your pitch look good by the pretty words you're writing that perfectly describe your book. Um, so Marissa Higgins uh, is the author of this. You can see that the, the book has changed. It's now called A Good Happy Girl. It's coming out from Catapult in April. Um, and this is the book description on Catapult's website right now that they went out, right? It's a poignant, surprising, and immersive read about a young professional woman pursuing an emotionally intense relationship, right, with a married lesbian couple. You can see how they changed that language, but it's in the same place, right? for readers of Kristen Arnett and Melissa Broder. So her query right off the bat with, with the comp was dead on, right? And then they bring in Melissa Broder, who's also weird in writing about like the topics that are kind of off the beaten path. And so then you still get some of this same copy, right? You get, you know, Helen, you still like, we don't care that she's a copyright attorney. She's a jittery attorney. Cool, cool. Um, oh, and she's self-destructive. Oh, we get that in there too, right? She's reeling from this crime. They describe what the crime is that her parents committed. Right? Um, she's, you get the compartmentalize, right? How she like, and then they soften the language, right? She's hooking up with couples. She's not, they're not talking um, just about what exactly is happening in the text, right? And so that's gonna be um, some fun for when the reader um, steps in, right? And so like what she's doing, you still get Catherine and Katrina, right, in there. Um, and you get the same language, right? The, the emotional intensity, 
that, that continues to be there. Um, um, and then you get, uh, you get the who, right, of like when her father begs her yet again for help getting parole, she realized she has a bargaining chip to get answers to her past, right? That's the same as that, um, you know, she, when she finally confronts them face to face, she's realized she's been asking the wrong questions and the person she least wants to see, right? And so you get to see how it makes its way down. Here's, a, here's another one um, on the memoir side. Is anyone writing memoir in here? No, okay, you don't care. <laughs> um, I mean, I could go through it, but like, so it's the same kind of thing, right? Um, and, and so she's got this template. So this um, landed her uh, an agent uh, through the same agency that we're represented at. Um, and so like meaningful personalization, if relevant, right? Just she knows like I need to say you something. And then she's got kind of this longish, um, let me, ex like when you're talking about memoir, you're selling your life as product, right? And so like that's a little weird, but she really manages it in a very nice way. And then she, she's like, she's talking about the why me at first, and then she's doing the pitch, and then she gives a little bit more of the why me, right? And you're noticing this number, the 70, 75, 80 number just keeps coming up again and again. Your novel is really lovely if it's 80,000 words, like right in that ballpark. Um, and here's another one that's like kind of magic. Um, and so it's important to see that like she, um, this is also someone with credentials, right? And so on the nonfiction side, um, she's writing for Washington Post and on parenting and Salon and Slate and Rumpus and Atlas Obscura, right? And then and she, she's also writing for weird stuff, right? So she's, um, she's writing for money. She's got Southwest Airlines in there. Whether or not she needs to put that, I don't know, right? Like I, that wouldn't be my first guidance, but it was fine, right? Um, but she's also saying, like, I have a degree in writing, and I have an MFA in writing, um, which those kinds of things, they help and they don't, right? At the end of the day, it's going to be what you're trying to prove in the why me is, here's why I am the right person to write this book right now. And all you're trying to do in this moment is make someone go, ooh, right? And, and so, and that's going to happen inside the pitch itself. Um, here's, some on the here's one on the science fiction side. I love this query um, and this entire publishing story. So he's saying um, right up off the bat, I cold, like, I'm cold querying you. I saw your profile in Publishers Marketplace. Remember, Publishers Marketplace is that newsletter that people are reading? Um, I see we share a love for John Scalzi's Old Man's War. The reason he saw that is that on every agent, there's agents' websites on side Publishers Marketplace, and you can see all their recent past deals, and you can see who they represent. And so he saw that this agent, Sarah Megabo, who's a lovely agent, uh, he, he saw that she was working on John Scalzi's work, phenomenal author, and he's saying, I like that author too, and, uh, and so we already have a shared connection, right? This is about connection. This whole industry is about connection. Um, connecting with the reader, connecting with your own work, connecting with the greater community of writers and readers. And so he's saying, I'm contacting you for a representative of my science fiction novel, The Darwin Elevator. The manuscripts complete at 130,000 words and can stand alone or become a series. So in science fiction, this is a big deal, right? Because you're only buying one book, but you want to know that there's going to be multiple books, right? Um, if it doesn't stand alone, you're in trouble. Um, this is longish, but not horrible. Right? But he's saying he's right in there. Right? And so, and he did the thing, right? It's science fiction. Here's the title. It's 130,000 words. It can be alone or it can be a series. And then he goes in to explain it, right? Everybody loves explaining a lot and a lot. Uh, and I've seen agents who, when they're sending out their pitch letter, so um, you send a pitch letter to an agent. An agent ex um, asks you, asks to represent you, um, like when all the stars are aligned. Um, asks to represent you, and then you guys sign a contract together. They work with you to get it ready for publication. Then they create a list of possible editors to whom they're going to send it. They then send a query letter to those editors, or they take them out to lunch, which is one of the ways that books are born in publishing, um, and they get them excited about this book, right? And so um, in, I know some agents who send out kind of long queries with all the details. Uh, I know some that are just like straight up, here it is, here's the two sentence hook, off we go, right? And so it sort of depends on the agent. Um, but this is another one where we're really getting into the depth of what is 
um, of the book itself, right? And, and so what he's doing, which I think is masterful here, is that he is explaining a whole science fiction worldview. Right? And in sci-fi, in horror, in dystopia, we can get lost because we're creating our own worlds. There's a lot of happening, right? It's why you get more word count, right? Because you're creating a world from scratch. How do you talk about that in a way that people who haven't read the book or been interested, how do you get them into your worldview and doing it succinctly? And so he does a nice job. So Skylar's immune to a disease that has wiped out most of humanity. Only one place on Earth is safe for those not immune. Darwin, Australia, where a space elevator of alien origin suppresses the disease. I understand what's happening here. That's a pitch, right? That's a who, what, and twist, like right in that first sentence. Um, trapped in the city, he goes on, the ragged citizens of Darwin rely on food grown abo abroad, orbiting space stations to survive. They rely on scavengers like Skylar, right? You get, the, you get him, like how he fits in, right, for everything else. With a small crew of fellow immunes, Skylar leads missions into the dangerous world behind Darwin's safe zone. He's searching for useless relics, uh, useful re relics of old earth, spare parts, ammunition, right? He goes into detail about all these things, right? Skylar's your dude, right? You need something from the immunes, he's the guy who's gonna get in and go in. Um, and then he's thrust into the middle of a conspiracy, rut row, right? Um, and so, and, he, and it's from the alien ship. Right, and so he's deep in the middle of all this stuff, and then you get that like lovely back of the book copy. As the uprising spirals into all-out war and the alien ship nears Earth, Skylar must risk everything to protect the secret he barely understands. There's multiple pitches in here that I can lean into, right? And so he, he's doing a really nice job kind of explaining it all. And here's his why me. I learned the art of creating fictional worlds while designing sci-fi video games, such as Alien vs. Predator, Extinction, and Metal Fatigue. I'm not a writer. I work in this parallel industry that's super cool. I'm dropping Alien and Predator, because I know you've heard of it, and I can talk about aliens, right? But I'm not a writer. Um, but here's how this matters. These titles feature intricate stories and complex characters. I feel this experience and my lifelong, lifelong passion for the genre has transferred well to the medium of the novel. Um, and I'll give you all your stuff. So that's Jason M. Howe. Jason M. Howe wrote The Darwin Elevator, which is what this pitch is, um, which he sent blind to Sarah Megabo, who, sold it to, who sold it to Del Rey. It has been a bestseller and a bestselling series for years and years and years and years. Um, he was kind enough to everyone else's um, query that you've seen here. I had a conversation with the author who gave me permission. Um, Jason Howe posted his on Reddit. and so. Uh, I wanted to give you some examples of what it looks like for successful queries and, and to get to see it all the way through on like what it actually becomes. And so now we're going to get to play with our own books. Remember the who, what, and twist? Remember how I told you like we're going to be um, doing some fun things with who, what, and twist? So it, if you are online, um, this is your moment in your desk to start really playing, thinking about your book with the who, what, and twist. Um, and I want you to take this moment, uh, if you're online, and, and really write that out. Write it out uh, so that you can start to say it out loud. If you are in this room, uh, congratulations, you have found a writing community. Uh, some of you have already found a writing community, thank you, uh, for being here for some past things. Uh, for those here, so I want you to make eye contact with someone um, could be in your row, could be around you. Um, and I want you to practice who, what, and twist about your own book. Right? Cool. Start doing that now. <laughs> um, and I'll put mine up just to give you some. But go talk to each other. Give them the first sentence. My, I am writing a blah, blah, blah genre. I'm writing a dystopian romance. I am writing a horror book. I am writing. And then try it out with the who, what twist. You should also give each other your names. <laughs>
Okay, friends, make sure that everyone in your group has had an opportunity to share. So if you haven't switched yet, this is the moment that you want to make sure you're all sharing. And then we'll see who's feeling brave. If you need more time, raise your hand. Okay, you get one minute more. <laughs> if you, if there was more of you. <laughs> All right, 15 more seconds.
Okay. If you are feeling brave, and be aware that we are being live streamed out to the internet, um, <laughs> um, what I'd love, uh, for, so first of all, um, uh, we're gonna come back together in group, um, and I'm gonna ask you to share if you're feeling comfortable. Uh, but first, thank the people next to you and around you with whom you've shared your work. Uh, you know, I, I know we're here to talk about query letters, but really the thing that I hope comes out of this room is connection. I know some of you have come with your writing group. I'm so excited there are writing groups. I did writing group matchmaking uh, uh, with the library um, this fall, <clears throat> and so it's exciting to see those matches. But uh, really, you, our work is not a solitary game. Right? We are in connection with other writers. You can see in your sales pitch, in your query letter, that you are already connected with other writers. My writing is like so-and-so and so-and-so. It's got the voice of this and the understanding of that. Right? We are in community with each other. And finding each other is the way out. Like That is the way this business works, and it makes you better humans. Right? And so uh, my hope is that you find connection and that people are connecting to your work as well. So who is feeling brave and wants to share to this very supportive and lovely room um, the pitch that they uh, created? Yay! All right, um, Aaron's coming around with the microphone. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Tell us first uh, your name, your pronouns, and uh, what genre you're in. My name is Joanna, she, her pronouns. My genre is kind of an intersection dark fantasy horror. All right. <clears throat> in the wake of a bloody coup, a lady in waiting turned assassin is sentenced to immurement in a cavern where prisoners are cursed to live forever, alongside the nine year old princess she recently orphaned. Ooh, everyone. Ooh. Right? Did we hear a who? Did we hear a what? Did we hear a twist? Do we understand what this book could be about? Yeah, round of applause. <laughs> solid, solid first draft, right? The goal is to make us go, ooh, and lean in. Who else is feeling brave? Ooh, yeah. Your name, your pronouns, and your genre. Uh, Laura, and um, non-committal she, her pronouns. <laughs> and I am writing a, f a picture book biography for children. Uh, so here's the, uh, the pitch. In 1733, Dr. Sam Nunez and the 41 Jewish passengers aboard the William and Sarah arrived at the shores of the Savannah Colony just a few months into its founding, only to find that they weren't allowed ashore. When a terrible illness breaks out in the colony, Dr. Sam has a chance to make an indelible mark on American history. Ooh. I have one more sentence. Can I yeah. add it? I th it might be too much, though. Dr. Sam Nunez, or sorry, Sam Nunez, MD, title of the book, centers around the struggle of one man determined to help others and open doors for the Jewish people in the face of discrimination. Ooh. All right, everyone. Ooh. Ooh. Um, did we hear a who? Did we hear a what? Do we hear a twist? Do we understand what this book's about? I want to read it. Right, like that, it, it, it's doing it. it. So it's gonna be difficult in an elevator when someone's like, oh, you're writing a book? What's your book about? That's gonna be harder to do, right? And so think about what's your like super catchy one, but on the page, like round of applause. It's, it's doing it. Who else is feeling brave? One more. Yeah, um, your name, your pronouns, and what you're writing. Uh, my name's Theo, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm writing a fantasy novel. Uh, a young Elvin Taylor, secretly in love with his best friend in a society that condemns homosexuality, has a bisexual crisis when he realizes he might actually have the possibility to find love and family with a woman, and is put in a position to choose a safer life or fighting to change society to, to be with the real love of his life, told from the dry perspective of his future ex-husband. Whoa! <laughs> Everyone in the room. Ooh. Ooh. Wow. I want to read that. You know, like, I, the, you know, we know who it is. We know what it's about. Uh, and we know, like, that's, that's a twist, right? Like, you get, um, and you're saying, like, there's a lot there, right? Uh, round of applause. Like, 
Y'all are good. You know what you're doing. Like, you have nailed this. Um, so thank you for, for being so brave, for, for sharing. Thank you for building with each other. Look at what you can create in 15 minutes, right? Like, pretty, pretty cool. <clears throat> so I am excited. Uh, so we've got some time to talk about comps and agents and proposals. Oh, my. Um, and so here's the next piece, right? And so you've got this pitch that you're, like, feeling really jazzed about, and you know what your book's about, and, like, it's going to be easy to, when, to, to start talking about your book. And I highly recommend you start talking about your book, which feels kind of like, right? We were like, oh, we're thinking about like generations loving our book. But really, it feels like an elephant in fluorescent lights, right? It's kind of, yeah, it feels icky to talk about your book. Um, one of the ways that we talk about our book is in community with other books, <clears throat> and that's comps. And so uh, a comp, uh, we've seen some of it come through in these pitches. It's a book similar to yours published in the last three years. You're like, three years? That's like a lot, not a lot of time. I can tell you in the last three years, there's been this little pandemic thing that has happened um, that has changed all of us, including the way books are sold. And so that is why the number used to be five years, um, but the whole world shifted. And I can give you an example on why comping to something a really long time ago doesn't quite work, right? Uh, if you were to camp to Harry Potter, let's um, take for a moment, um, you know, the author's politics out of the equation, right? If you were to comp to Harry Potter, um, that borders existed when Harry Potter was being sold, right? Like, uh, Amazon wasn't the, really the player that it is today. The entire book industry has shifted, and that is what has happened again in this pandemic, right? And so the reason why, on the publishing side, why comps matter, not only does it get us an idea of like, oh, Kristen Arnett's stuff is strange, and it's going to be kind of spooky, and, uh, and, and it's going to be off the beaten path, and that's kind of like my work, great. Um, on the and what we're doing on the publisher side inside the editorial room is we are literally running the numbers. And so we pull up the ISBN, uh, which is the individual, I don't remember what the acronym is, but it, <clears throat> it's the specific number for the format of every book. Right? Every book gets its own, own number. Um, it's that like little barcode on the back. Um, you pull up the ISBN uh, in all the formats that it's in, and you see what the sales data is. And then from there, you do some math, your business manager is doing some math to figure out how many books will this book in front of me sell? How much can I afford to pay the author for this book? And so all of that comes from the comps of like, oh, okay, this book uh, sold a decent amount to, oh, you know what, um, this is a niche market. We think this book needs to be in the world. But <clears throat> it's going to be very specific. And so that means that we're going to have to sell in a specific way. Or, oh, you know what? There's a huge sales hook and a huge publicity hook here. And this specific book rode that train. If we kind of follow that model, it might be able to ride the train too. Yeah. OK, that's an excellent question. The question was, do they like it to be a super, po super popular book or no? I can't comp to the New York Times number one bestseller. Because when that happens, the stars have aligned. I cannot tell you how many books I have worked on where we put everything into that book and it did nothing. And on the flip side, books that hit number one that we were like, hmm, this had a normal marketing spend. We're not entirely sure how that happened. <laughs> right? Like I've been in both scenarios, but they're both awkward with awkward authors, right? Because uh, the author who's, we had an author, um, a phenomenal writer um, who had crossed over from Christian publishing into um, like women's book club fiction, right? And she had just made the cross, and we were all kind of unsure and like, will her audience come with her, and how will that work? And and her first book did what we kind of expected her book to do. Her second book was stratospheric. Like, I mean, you look at the numbers, and they were like this. Um, and we. We were coming to, she was coming in, and we were making a decision about what would the advance be on books three and four, right? Like, what would that deal look like? And her agent had uh, made it clear to her editor that they were expecting a very large check. Um, and we looked at it, and we realized 
that there was a little bit of yellow on the color of that book, which uh, the same year, the Nightingale had a little bit of yellow on the cover, and Amazon, through its magic, was like, oh, this book is like this book, and kind of matched them together. I can never, as a publisher, replicate that. I can't, right? And so I can't write her the check I would want to write her, because I can't guarantee that that magic thing that happened will happen again. And what happened in book three is that it did about what book one did, right? And so uh, if you are comping to something that is stratospheric, um, you are saying to me, I don't understand the market. I'm gonna tell you, with Uncultured, we comp to educated. Like, so I broke the rules. I knew the rules, I broke them. I felt strong enough that it is a similar story, right? Tara Westover, raised in a religious fundamental extreme, never ever went to school. Um, she, goes to, she goes to Oxford, Daniela joined the army. Right? We felt like it was strong. And so in our, uh, uh, you see, uh, okay. um, in our language, you see for readers of Uncultured in the Glass Castle, which was published 10 years ago and was the, like, uh, it's the, the doorstop, right, of the, of like trauma memoirs, right? Um, and so we felt that it, it had that in it, but also like our comps in terms of our proposals uh, were to, um, to books like um, uh, uh, Chanel, uh, uh, call me by my name, I can't remember Chanel's last name. Um, so you want to be like in the same family. You want to understand like what are the books that are like your book that makes them similar who are the authors that you're following? Remember, we're talking about connection, right? You are part of a writing community, and, you're, and the books in your genre are your community. So who are the authors who are like, you know, they're going to be on stage with Oprah, right? And who are the authors who are aspirational peers, right? That like when, we, when a book is launched, you are often in conversation with somebody. Who's the somebody that you would be in conversation with is a way that I like to think about comps, right? Like it gets kind of scary when we're like, oh, in the last three years and I don't know. And it's especially scary if you are an author who is traditionally underrepresented in publishing. And so let me tell you, like I'm telling you about comps and why they're necessary and why they're important. And I personally think that they are uh, the barometer of a system that is bro broken and, um, and unjust. Uh, traditionally, we have not published black writers. Uh, traditionally, we have underpublished black writers or we have segregated them to urban fiction, right? There's not a ton of black literary fiction. There's not a ton of black science fiction. There's not a ton of black horror. There's not a ton of black romance. It's starting to get better, but it's bad, right? And so if you're like, I have a story about black women, like, well, okay, you're not comping to Toni Morrison, right? <laughs> And so it's true though, right? You know, like it's such a, it's such a tricky place. And so um, the publishing industry is attempting to get better. It's still bad, right? Like I need to level with you, it's bad. And so what does that mean for you if you are a person who like you look around and you like legitimately look around and there's not comps on the shelf? Like what does that mean? That's when you start to cherry pick, right? It's got the voice of this, it's got the that of that. Right? There are books. Um, and so if you, you know, if you tell me uh, as a publishing person there's no other book in the world like mine, my immediate thought is that you have not done your homework. You are not in community. You are an island. And I'm not interested in your book. That's really where it is. If you tell me that it's kind of a merge of different genres and you don't quite know, 10% of those are going to be a merge of different genres and they're gonna be amazing and they're gonna do that cool thing and 90% of them are going to be unbuyable and unsellable. And the reason why they're unsellable is because publishing's a business and it's a business based on connections. And so the memoir buyer at Barnes & Noble is a different human being than the, uh, than the romance buyer, right? And so if you have a romance memoir, I don't know the person to sell it to. It is that easy. Right, and so it's not completely difficult to make, like if you are doing it, there are tons of books that do. Um, 
but they're the minority. If you want a straighter publishing path, you're following the like, this is in this genre, and this is in its word count, and like, this is the way forward. Does that make sense of like, it's nuanced, but it's um, like, there are ways forward. Like, when you're thinking about comps, you know, what are the books that are like yours? Like, what makes them like yours? Right? Really read these books like a writer. And if you're like, I haven't really read, right? Like, I, you know, ideally, when you're putting together your query package, you're going to know five writers in your genre that are out this season, right? Like, you understand what's happening in your genre. You're experts. And I use genre very, very loosely. Right? Whatever you're writing, you understand what's on those shelves. The way that you understand what's on those shelves, I can do an entire talk on comps. Um, the way you understand what's on those shelves is you're going to your library, you're going to your bookstore, you're, you're talking to writers, you're seeing what's happening on social media. You are engaged. right? Uh, and you're kind of understanding. Right? What are the best sellers? What are the legends? What's selling? Like, Understand, you know, we're talking about products. right? Uh, if you were to launch a product uh, through your company, right, you would do market research. You would do product analysis. You would understand what the other sweaters are coming out in fall and how everybody's using green or whatever, right? Like, understand that about your book. Yeah? Could you say something about the choosing the book you're reading? Because you can't read everything in the genre. I look like for the ones with good reviews, good purpose reviews, or, you know, good reviews and all that. Like, we're not supposed to Okay, so the question is, um, what, how do I know what I should be reading? Uh, there's a lot, and I don't know how to choose. Yeah? Okay. Um, it's a, that's a great question. Um, so when we were doing Uncultured, I have a spreadsheet of 60 books. I didn't read all of them. Um, I, I looked at, <clears throat> I looked at um, what is, like, what am I drawn to? What feels like the same book? Like literally going to the bookstore or the library and like walking the shelf and like picking it up and reading the back and going, oh, do I, does this sit with me? How do I feel about that? And then, um, and then skimming it, right? Kind of quickly while you're there, you're gonna set aside, if you're really like doing comps, you're gonna set aside an afternoon like to be in a bookstore. Like it's that season where we like being in libraries and bookstores, right? Like we're book people, we love this. Like I'm giving you good homework, right? Um, and so you'll kind of go and skim and figure out and then you'll check out or you'll buy the ones that feel like they're powerful. When I'm working on comps for authors, so right now in my office I have 40 books I checked out from the library, and the way I went through them was I picked it up and I went, does this sort of feel like in the same genre as what she's writing? She's actually writing um, like business self-help for women. Does that make sense? Like prescription nonfiction. And like, okay, look at the packaging. Is this kind of, can I imagine, you know, this book packaged in a similar way? Who's the audience that they're going for? Are they my audience? You have to know who your audience is. That's why knowing who your genre is is super helpful, right? Like, oh, is it, does this kind of have the right feel? And then you can kind of sort through them. I love a spreadsheet. I'm a girl who loves a spreadsheet. Like a 60,000 line spreadsheet is my home, which you wouldn't think from like a girl with a fiction writing degree, um, but it's true. Right? And so like keeping track and then understanding, like you can get an idea of how a book is selling by how many reviews are on Goodreads and Amazon, right? Like that's a, uh, a, a wonderfully straightforward way to, to kind of get an idea. You can see if it's critically acclaimed. Um, if it's the number one bestseller, like keep that as an asterisk, right? Like and you'll know what the bestsellers are, but like if it's the number one and it is the and it's been on the list for 300 weeks, that's not going to be the right one for you, right? It's going to make it. But like, if it's kind of in that middle ground of um, of a book that was critically acclaimed, you know, a book like Uncultured looks really great, right? Like we weren't a number one New York Times. We didn't hit the list, right? And so that's like a comparable book, right? And, if you think that you're writing is on par, go for it. <laughs> right? Like, well, about, okay, well, the question was, uh, if it's a Newberry writing, and I'm saying, 
you know, the, just sound it because of that. But what you, you just saying is of the voiceover. Yeah, the yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, just what makes books really fun is that I'm like, here are what you could do. And really, I'm also like, you saw all the things I gave you, like, there's not really rules, right? Like, you're presenting yourself professionally, you're presenting yourself as someone who has done their homework, and you're presenting yourself as someone, all the goal is, is that I'm going to lean in and go, ooh, your agent is going to send you a lot of comps. You're going to have a lovely conversation with your agent and add to your spreadsheet, and they'll go, oh, that book didn't sell quite enough, or uh, that book's uh, a little too much, or, you know, um, this one sold a lot, but sales really hated it for some random reason that has nothing to do with anything, so we're not going to put it down. Like, really, like, seriously, I have had those conversations. They are weird and exhausting. Um, you, too, can be on this uh, lovely journey. Um, and so it, it just has to be good enough, right? All you're trying to do is someone to lean in and go, ooh. Oh, um, you'll play with it. You'll figure out what feels right. Um, other questions about comps? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so the question was, uh, I know, I think I know what genre I'm in. I've got some things in the genre that are going to push it. Yeah. Do I talk about that? Okay. Just like, like 50 Shades of Grey. Like she was trying to find comps, you know, it's just something we all know. Like does she own to, you know, how graphic or what that kind of thing? Uh, no, so uh, she, um, I came to Penguin Random House the year after everyone was bonus because of Fifty Shades. Um, and literally at the Christmas party where everyone literally got a big check, and it was a big check, um, everyone was kind of like, huh? And Marcus Doyle, who was the CEO that year, he gave it, he was a, a lovely, wonderful man. Um, and, and, um, uh, German, and so has some quirks that are um, delightful in a CEO. And so he was giving this very gesticulate talk, and, and everyone is like in the room going, but is there going to be a check? Is there going to be a check? <laughs> there was not a check, and he played with us uh, accordingly. Um, so Fifty Shades is, lives in erotic romance, uh, which is its own genre. And so I've worked on a number of those, and we talk about um, heat and the index of heat um, it's amazing the kind of 9 a.m. meetings I've had. Um, and so she would definitely talk about that. And so that, that is a good example. Um, I'm sorry for the not safe for work content. Uh, it's very safe for the publishing work. Um, and so it would, I don't know how she pitched that, and I don't know how it was comp. So I'm, let me say that. But um, I can tell you that there have been erotic romances that I have worked on that push the, the genre. And they do say that, right? Like, here's, here's where we normally live. This book is like these other books. And also, it adds to it because of blah, right? And so you would definitely. Even if other genres are pushing something out, you would say, like, it's a memoir, but there's these other aspects. OK, so um, the question got more nuanced, like, so it's memoir, but I've got these aspects of, like, pastiche or novels or something. Yeah. That's where it, um, it gets harder to sell. Right? And so, you know, think about other, when I mean, you're thinking about comps, who else has done that inside the genre that has been selling recently? Um, it doesn't make it uh, a, uh, an impossible sell, it makes it a less straightforward sell. It is much easier to say, this is a coming of age memoir and it's 80,000 words. Right, as opposed to this is kind of auto fiction, and it you know like it like the weirder it gets, the harder to sell. You can still sell it; it's just harder. Yes.
Yeah, so the, the question is, can you flip comps on its head and, and go from, um, um, my book has XYZ themes, which is different, which is similar to this book. Um, I dislike the way that this book was handled, and so my book is better in this way. Uh, I would advise you that latter part um, gets a little dicey, right? I hate this book. If I worked on this book, I might not love you, know, you as a client, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I would avoid arrogancy in your in your query letters. You want to be someone people want to work with. Um, can you can you cherry pick? It's got the voice of this and the you know and the um, and the characters of this. Absolutely. Um, my friend Aaron Hosier, who's a, a brilliant agent, um, will even and I I personally hate this on the publishing side. Um, she'll even um, t pick from pop culture. Right, like this movie or this television show, something that's really hot right now. It is such a mess on the publishing side because I can't run a PNL off of um, whatever TV show is hot, right? <laughs> like I, I, and so it gets kind of. Um, we like the comps, and I'm teaching you the comps, like to be real book comps. Um, the thing about publishing that's really cool is that if it works on the page, it's good. Right, like you can break the rules. I'm teaching you the rules. Rules. Um, I'm teaching you a way in that has been proven. Right, like what you wind up doing, you do, and and it either delivers in the read. That's what we call it when uh, no matter what happens, we miss a train stop or we, um, you know, are cold in the bath or we're, you know, like we're just reading and can't stop. Right, and and. Your query letter's meant to stop me in my tracks. That's the goal of it, right? If it makes me come in and go, ooh, it works. You don't worry it too hard of like, it has to be right. There is no right. You're, you are the authority. Um, finding an agent, um, you might notice that this slide and this slide are very similar, um, except this slide has fewer pictures. Um, because guess what? Just like finding comps, finding an agent means that you understand your genre. You understand what people want right now. And you understand, like, understanding the what leads you to the who. So if you know the books that are similar, and the authors that you follow, and the books that are like yours, and who the best sellers are in your categories, and who are the, the, your aspirational peers, and who's selling right now, and what makes their book like yours, you, it's a very easy jump to who are the people who represent those folks. Because in the acknowledgments of every single book, the first or second paragraph is, I would like to thank my agent. So in, uh, let me say, on the adult side, it's in every book. In uh, picture books, you're uh, generally at the end of every book, you get like maybe the colophon and the um, copyright. That, uh, that is true. Um, on the adult side, when you, have an acknowledge when you have an acknowledgment section in a book, um, you get who the agent is. You can Google an author and find out who their agent is. You can look in publisher's marketplace and find out where their agents are. What I'm saying to you is understand your book. You know, being able to, to give a pitch the way that I just asked you to do it, and you can do a pitch in many different ways, right? But doing it the way I asked you to do it already makes you like understand your book, right? And so once you start to understand comps, then it's an easy jump to who are these agents? What are they doing right now? Uh, you want to make sure when you are looking for an agent that you're doing the work. So the work is annoying because every single agent is going to ask for something different. And you're like, but that's a pain. You're like, yes, especially if you're compiling spreadsheets. Remember I said I love a spreadsheet? Um, you're going to compile a spreadsheet of not just one, like who's your dream agent, but multiple people who could be your dream agents, right? Who are the people, like if you read interviews about them and you're like doing research, remember where they're still talking about products, right? And, and how these are products. And so one of the things that we need uh, for our product is for someone to go out and sell it. And that's what an agent does, just to, to step back. Um, a literary agent is someone who uh, represents your book to a publisher. And they broker the rights for that publisher 
to buy the, the right to publish your book. You still own the manuscript, you are copyrighted to you, they own the ability to package and send out your book into the world based on the terms that they agree, that you all agree to. to for this work, your agent uh, will take 15, that's one five, uh, percent of anything that you make. Um, and we'll step back one more thing. Um, the way publishing math works, um, like how do authors get paid? Uh, you are paid, everyone eats together. And so you agree to, you send a query to an agent, they call you, there's like a lovely day where it's like a phone call and, every, and you're crying and they're crying and, and it's like a love fest, it's a lovely moment, right? You have that phone call, they send you a contract that says, um, and this contract is tricky, um, but generally it says, for the life of the book, which is 50 years after the author's death, and if you're like, but I'm the author, yep, it's a really, really long time, so sign carefully. Um, my contract with Daniela is a stronger like legal contract than with my husband, right? Because I, literally, it's our grandchildren, it's 50 years past our death, who are going to be managing the rights to our work. Um, you know, my husband, I just get it until I die, right? <laughs> like, um, and so we joke about that. But uh, sign your contracts carefully. How um, the money in publishing works, right? So you have this moment where the, everyone signs together, like, yay. They go out to a publisher. They're shopping your work. You're working on your work together. There is no money exchanging hands. There's still no money exchanging hands. There's more money exchanging hands. And uh, publishers like, yes, we would love the opportunity. You work out a deal agreement. They, uh, you sign it. Upon the signing of a contract, which is not the same as the signing of a deal, a contract's like a 40-page document that legal has gone through and it's long and fun. Um, upon the time that you sign the contract, is payment one. Um, when the book comes out a year or two years later, it's payment two. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. When, you, when they accept the manuscript, which is six, three, nine, 12, 15 months later, depending on what you, what you navigate, uh, is when uh, you get your second payment. Um, when the book comes out, you get your third payment. And if it's in paperback, you get your fourth payment. And so Daniela and I started working on Uncultured in 2019. We sold it in 2021. Um, we, uh, so we, we did two years where no one made any money. Um, we received a quarter of it uh, upon, upon signing the contract. Uh, we, we, we sold it in March and we delivered in September. So we received a second payment in September, um, a payment in September of 2022 when the hardcover came out, and then the fourth payment in November of this year, like last month, uh, when the paperback came out. That's a long way to go for money, right? Like if you're looking at ROI as we're talking about businesses, this is like a long play. Uh, so when you're finding an agent, um, be. You, that relationship that you're curating and that you're connecting with, it's a business relationship, right? They're going to be your business representative. And so they want to make sure that you're a professional in the way that they're a professional. And so they ask you to do kind of boring work. Part of the reason they ask you to do boring work is because they are, they get a lot of submissions and they have a workflow that works for them. Part of the reason they're asking for boring work is they want to make sure like the, what's the, the, um, the story with the blue M&Ms and the writer, um, there's some, oh goodness, um, there's, a, a, there's a band that has a really, uh, a really strong stage and it, it, it's intricate, it has a lot of pieces. In, it's Van Halen, thank you. So the band is Van Halen, they have an intricate stage set up. They have an intricate stage set up to the point where they know that like, they can die if the stage is set up incorrectly. So in their, in their writer, the very like one of the very last things in their writer is like blue M and M's. Like they have to have blue M and M's in the in the dressing room. You have to, like, or, or, you have to, like, pick or pick out the blue yeah. M and M. Right? It's a pain in the butt to do. Yeah. Right? And it is a deliberate pain um, because they want to make sure that the writer has been read. And so this is one way to say like, is this person someone I want to work with? And that is the question you should be asking about the agent too. Right? When you talk to them on the phone or you see them on 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 Instagram or you hear them talk, are you like Dana Renee Green and are like, I am so inspired by this person, I wanna be around them? Or are they like, ooh, that, that one's kinda of icky, right? Like, don't choose the icky ones. Choose the people who you gel with, right? Because they're going to be your business partner. 
And so you want to make your list of all the agents, and we'll talk a little bit. Uh, I've got uh, a tool for you. Um, and then you want to check their website. And so they have all this stuff. This is what's been on the screen this whole time of like, here's what we want, right, and how we want it. Um, and then you want to follow the directions because we're creating a business relationship together. That makes sense? Um, here are some agent examples where people are like, how do I know if an agent is good? Um, here are a few. So we're represented by Distoco Direct and Beret. Michael Beret is our agent. Um, Serendipity is a lovely one. Andrea Brown. Um, Writer's House is like uh, stalwart. Um, uh, Mendel Media Group, that's Scott Mendel who's in there. Ayesha Pandy Literary. Uh, she's one of my favorite agents because she understood that if we read widely and we read diversely, um, we all win, and she has represented uh, authors of color for longer than uh, when the industry was like, oh, we, we need books by more than white women. Um, so uh, uh, Aisha Pandey is fantastic, uh, as is her agency, UTA. Um, Deno Carlson and Lerner, um, Aaron Hosier, who I mentioned earlier, who um, uh, likes to give a pop culture reference in her, in her um, in her queries, uh, she's an agent there. So that's just a couple um, for you to, um, to figure out. There's a, there's a tool called Query Tracker, um, which is free online, or you can pay $25 a year, and you can get kind of like a fancy version. Um, and you can search for literary agents this way. And so um, you can see like what you can like. If it's got a star, it means that I've paid for it. Uh, but things without a star, I haven't. Um, and so you can search by genre, you can search by agent name, you can kind of start to see and like send things over and so you can kind of create a list. Uh, a closed agent means that it's an agent that is no longer accepting submissions. A question, if you come across an agent and they're like, send me your stuff, and then you go to their website and they're like, so-and-so is closed to queries, ignore what's on their website, send them your stuff because they've asked you to, right? Like if I meet you, uh, some, right? Um, and um, yeah, so that's what closed agent means. Um, this is Michael's um, stats, just to give you, like Query Tracker shows you all of the stats. And so remember I promised you really depressing numbers? This is the moment, uh, so leave now if you don't wanna be depressed. Um, they do this thing that's really cool where they show you like what's the reply rate. So. Um, many of the agents are now um, getting things through um, Query Manager, which is like the flip side. And so this company um, um, tracks the data both ways. And so uh, you upload into like this form um, on, their, like, on their website. And so Query Tracker is also tracking in real time, like how many replies have they, um, how many replies have they, um, given, which is literally like, thank you for sending. How many times have they requested something, right? You see that number is like uh, worse than Harvard. Um, and then um, um, a a among that, like the sub's reply rate, right? And so you get the, um, like when's the last time they replied? When was the last time they requested something? What's their average What's uh, in terms of request and rejection, right? Um, so the, here's Michael's, and this is why this um, right now, so every, during this pandemic, remember how I was like, oh, book publishing changed in two years. Um, one of the things that also changed is that um, we had a lot of time in our houses, and so we as writers wrote books. And so uh, in the last year, the numbers of queries that agents are getting has, uh, not, has increased a hundredfold. Um, so that's scary. Um, that said, I gave you a success story at the top of this. I can't say her book because it is about to be announced, right? And so there are successes to be had, but let's be realistic about what we're looking at. And a lot of it is numbers, right? And so he got 1,598 queries in one year. Like, to give you, remember we're talking connection and people, um, the human cost of this to agents, like they are overwhelmed beyond, right? So remember there are people, we're all people trying to do our best. Um, he didn't request any partials. He requested 37 fulls. He rejected most of them. Um, and then there are 18 that he just sort of left in the ether, right? 
And this is all time, so you get kind of like what it was to what it is, don't take my word for it, um, of really where he was. So um, again, 1500 this, let's say 1600 this year, um, 4700 of all time, um, he's requested 215. Uh, if someone wants to do the math of that percentage, I'd appreciate it. I'm not your gal for that, um, but mostly he's rejected, right? Uh, an author who I know um, whose book came out from um, Putnam, no, from Dutton last, the year before last, um, she queried 149 agents, one replied. Thank you, it's 4%, this is what that number is, right? So um, the number kind of at the front there where it gives you that number um, is accurate in Query Tracker, and thank you for the mathing in the room. Questions about queries and Query Tracker? It's a lovely little tool, yeah. Um, is there an etiquette around how many agents you submit to a Ah, agent strategy. Um, the question was, um, is there etiquette about how many agents you submit to at the same time? It is considered uncouth to submit to more than one agent in the same agency at the same time. Um, but if you are rejected by one, depending on what the agency's rules are, and they say it on their website, um, you can resubmit to another. Um, uh, there are some people who recommend you do it in batches of 10, and you kind of get a feel of like, is the query working? Do I need to, you know, pop the query? Uh, generally, so what, remember, we, we, I gave you some successful queries and what good looks like. Good looks like with um, how you know you're on the right track is you get anything other than a form letter. A really nice no, you're nailing it. Like, really. Um, because there's lots of reasons why it might not deliver. I almost put in for you all of the rejections we got. Right? You, get, you get to see me on the other side of like, New York Times recommended our book, and we, look, it, was, it got starred reviewed. We also got lots and lots of rejections for, for things that were in our control and that weren't. Um, Children of God books were too depressing. It was really what someone said to us. Um, I, I see you, I'll get there. Um, you know, I, I mean, there, whoop, um, you know, uh, a, a, a dear friend of mine um, who I worked with who said to me, these are two books. She's like, you can't put a cult and the army in one book, it's two books. And I was like, I editorially disagree with you, but cool, you know, like, but that was why she said no. Um, and, and then we had things that were like, oh, we're publishing uh, another cult memoir. We don't want to have two in the season, right? Like, I can't control that. You know, I can deliver, I can control, like, writing really good copy, packaging it in a publishing smart way that you all are gonna be able to do. You can't control what the market's doing. That's not you, right? And so release that. Um, and so some people are sending in batches of 10. Uh, I've seen people who are like, here's 50, go forth world, right? Um, I think um, uh, it depends on, for me, the genre and the time of year. Um, which there is no good time of year. There used to be, but uh, the pandemic changed all of that. Um, publishing some used to shut down in December, uh, like that second week in December, I wouldn't send a query. Now it's fine because people are reading it like the day after Christmas and then that week when everyone's off. Um, I like, like you have, you know, five that you're super excited about. I pick one from that list and four others. Right, and so that way I start to get through my list of like, here are the, who are the people I want, but like if I'm, if I'm not right, right, I have kind of a cushion and some folks to help me understand, but um, there aren't really rules, right? You're, this is gonna be a thing of like, what's your gut say? Um, uh, the Sarah Megabo query that I showed you, he only sent to her, right? The time, I'm also like, publishing's really different, but like that, that's there too. Um, you had a question. So the question's, uh, can, I re can I resubmit to the same agent? Generally, no. Unless they invite you to resubmit, um, you're one and done. Uh, yeah. Uh, but is that really true? Even if it's different? Yes. Unless they've invited you to resubmit. You can do it. Like, um, they just don't like it, right? You've already, like, uh, but, and so, because you know that you're already coming into someone who's like, I've rejected this already. 
right? Like, why are you spending your energy on someone who isn't the right fit for you right now? I mean, then own that, right? Like, take your chances, you really love them, right? And so the, the question was, but, but I wrote a bad letter. Okay, so reintroduce yourself. Call, you know, I think that generally when um, I'm doing something that I know is verboten, I call it, right? I'm super intentional about, I am doing this verboten thing because, right? And so then there's not the elephant in the room of like, why is she querying me again? It's, I really want you to represent me, and I think I missed last time. And so I hope that, you know, you don't mind. Right? Ask uh, forgiveness, not permission. Right? Like, fine. Be brave. Like, you get to play. Like, this is your career. Right? We're talking about your work. You get to do it the way you want. Questions on agents? Thank you. Uh, who's writing nonfiction? Excellent. Uh, in addition to a query letter, so when you are writing fiction, you need a query letter and a finished manuscript. Finished, finished. Finished, 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 finished. Like. I can send it to you and I can read all of it and it's good, right? Like that's what finished manuscript means because there's nothing more like devastating when you read like, like oh my gosh, I love this book. Here's 40% of it. Like no, <laughs> right? Like, like you know what it's like to be like, I can't put this down and then it just ends, right? And so it needs to be done if you're writing a novel. If you are writing a nonfiction book or a memoir um, and some memoirs kind of live in this in between, uh, you need a book proposal. A book proposal is a, essentially a business plan for your book. Um, you like your query letter has three things, your, your book proposal has four things. It's, um, it's got kind of this overview section, and then inside the overview section, there's also an overview. Uh, why do we use the same term twice differently? Don't know, um, but um, it, it's got that. Um, it's got your annotated tab table of contents and your chapter summaries. If you are writing a nonfiction book, the best thing that advice I can give you is to write your chapter summaries right now. Start there, because then you understand what your book is, because you're writing a paragraph for each chapter, and so you then have the roadmap for your book, whether you're pantsing it or not, or plotting it, right? Like, you understand your book because of those chapter summaries. You'll want sample material, you'll want an author bio and, and marketing. Like book, nonfiction books are sold on platform for the most part, uh, which you're like, oh, but that I don't have a platform. That's kind of a bummer. Yes, uh, please spend time building your platform. Um, and also sometimes it does happen, but it's harder, right? Um, but understanding your marketing. Memoirs are different. It delivers in the read. Uh, prescriptive nonfiction. Here's how to do something. If you are an expert in your field on how to do that thing, that's going to be a good match. Um, two books that I really love. Um, how to write a book proposal. Uh, the secret isn't in, like, do I get the formula right of, like, what if there's only two chapters in the overview, and what if there's, you know, like, we can, we can sweat the small stuff. The important stuff is, like, are you nailing the pitch? Are you nailing the summaries? Like, how are you making that work? Um, and so um, Jody Rain and Michael Larson, not related to me, uh, book really shows you in depth how to write a book proposal. Sue Shapiro's The Book Bible is a lovely how books happen. She um, has interviewed a number of editors in fiction and nonfiction and really talks about how books come to be. It's a great resource. I promised in a, in a proposal um, there's an overview, um, and, in, and that overview is like called thing, weird things. So inside the overview, it's, it's, this is a letter to the editor. Hi, here is why you want to pay me a boatload of money to write a book that doesn't exist yet, right? That you're making a case for your book. And so the overview, it gives that hook, and so you've got two to three pages that are really compelling. A lot of times it's the introduction to the book. Um, sometimes it's not, but it, it, you start the proposal dropping them right into the, into the work itself, right? And then you're teasing them because you are only giving them two pages, right? It's very different than a novel where all I want to do is read more, the overview, and the hook, it's giving me two to three pages, right? Oh, oh, I want to read more. The proposal is doing the same thing as the query letter. Oh, I want to read more. That's all it's trying to do. Then it explains what the book's about, um, why now, why you. You're like, wait a minute, that's just like what's in a query letter. Sure is. Um, and then you want to go into depth on who will buy it, the audience, the demographics, the statistics. Like, there's a lot more math than you ha think you have signed up for. Welcome. It's a business. Um, and so really understanding your market. Remember how I was, like, talking about all that? It matters. Um, 
your platform and your marketing advantages. Like, under, if you have a platform, and when I say platform, of under 5,000 people, whether it's a newsletter or people you talk to in rooms or whatever social media platform that you like, if it's under 5,000, it's not considered a platform that you can really tap into. Because if you start doing like marketing math, like if you assume like 30% open an email, of any 30% that open an email, 3% are going to act, start doing the numbers of who's gonna buy a book from that. That's the math that a publisher is thinking about when they're thinking about platform, right? They're trying to figure out how many people do they bring to the table? How many people do they reach? If you are someone that doesn't have a large platform but you speak to people who are influential on large platforms, mention that. Does that make sense? Um, and then your comp titles. So we've talked about comps, we've talked about proposals, we've talked about agents. Let me open it up and pitches and what good looks like. What questions do you have for me on how this all comes together? Um, so I generally don't share the decks, but uh, is the live stream available for download later? It'll be on the YouTube channel, so there you go. Um, enjoy me in syndicast. <laughs> uh, other questions? Yes? Oh, God. <laughs> I'm so hoping to not have an AI question. <laughs> Uh, to, to actually, AI to build out some of the questions. Uh, so the, the question is, how has AI uh, uh, come into play with queries? Uh, um, I can tell you, so um, how queries, let me give you some more depressing news. Um, queries are often read by the intern in the agency. Um, I was that intern, I was 20, I couldn't buy a drink. Right? Uh, and I am like, hello, here are my hopes and dreams. And that came in the day where like, people were sending boxes of, because um, I've had some years in the industry. Um, so an intern is reading this and making their best decisions anyway. And the, then what happens is that they create a reader report. They create a reader report on, on most of them um, that says, here's why you should read this. And here's a summary of the summary. Right? <laughs> like that's, that's literally. Um, and then there's a conversation that happens. Um, from there. There are some agents who are reading their own stuff. They're, you can tell because um, their queries are slower. Um, no agent that I have seen ha has publicly said that they're using AI. I can tell you that there are a number of AI and publishing um, talks that are coming around. Um, and so everyone has their eye on it. No one, and, and this is true on the publishing side as well, like no one in one of the big five presses is saying we're using AI to produce anything that we're working on. It's a touchy place because we work in copyright, we work in content. Um, we feel weird about the robots taking over, right? <laughs> um, and so I, I don't know that you're gonna hear it, but also it's happening so fast. And so as of right now, no one has come forward and been like, it's yes. Not like, it's not like an app that's using something. Not that they're admitting to. <laughs> yes. So the question is, is it compelling for publishers if uh, an agent's um, if, uh, if they have a social media presence. Yes, it's above 5,000 and it's engaged. Um, you know, the strategy, I've taught social media and platforms to authors, like that was part of my job at Penguin Random House, it was part of my role at, uh, I was a journalist at the Chicago Tribune and was talking with them about platforms uh, before that. And the strategy on platform has changed so violently um, and so my favorite is that you have your own newsletter, right, or Substack or wherever, but you own your list, right? Twitter, 
has uh, become X and uh, took a nosedive in the last year. Uh, people who had curated Twitter, um, that has made their platform go away. And, and many people in the industry aren't even sure if they should be using Twitter. TikTok may be banned, right? Right now, book talk is a thing. It is how books are coming into being. But who knows if the government's going to be cool with TikTok in a year because they're having conversations in Congress, right? And so what can you control, right? And so you do want to demonstrate some piece of here's how I'm in this conversation. Here's how I am connected to this community. Here's how I influence people who will want to read my book, right? Because that's essentially what you're doing, right? You're, you're saying, I am worth your time and attention, and that's what you're, the pitch is to a reader, right? Uh, and so how do you demonstrate that, uh, whether it's through social or not? Another thing that people ask me <clears throat> um, is, do blurbs matter? And so I know someone who knows someone who would be willing to say, this book is good, Right? Like a blurb is that like uh, little piece on the back of the book. Do we use that in proposals or in query letters? And it helps. It really does. If, if someone big in your genre or even smallish in your genre is willing to blurb your book, uh, do mention it in your query or proposal. Yes? So the question is, uh, how short can I go and still be published? Um, and so um, we sell um, uh, we sell novellas at sixty five thousand words. Um, if you're like, oh, um, and the price point is vastly different. So what I've seen some authors do uh, and publishing houses do, and what I did as a publisher is we. Uh, we would uh, like razor and blade strategy, right? If we're thinking about products, so we would um, have book one of a series, have book two of the series, or have a novella um, that we would sell to get you into book two or book three, right? And so inside genre, you're cool, but that's not what you're going to be leading the charge with, right? Um, is it worth, like, I don't want to tell you don't query. Right, um, but if it's drastically shorter, it's harder. That said, one of the trends that's happening now is that shorter books are a thing. <laughs> and so, because I think actually, in part, because paper and ink is expensive, will that be true in two to three years when your book is coming out? I don't know, right? And so, I, I want to give you a path that I know has been followed. The more you deviate from that path, the heart you need to like the stars really need to align, right? And so it's not undoable, but it's harder. And so, what path do you want to be on? Yes. Haha. <laughs> So how do editors work is essentially the meta question of all those questions. Um, and so we're talking traditional publishing, yeah. right? Uh, if we're going the agent route, self-publishing, whole other ball of wax, I will say if you are self-publishing all that work to understand your pitch and your audience, that really pays off for you because you're then doing all that work. Uh, 60 hands are coming together to make uh, to love a book into life in traditional publishing. And so your agent uh, will then send out queries to a bunch of editors, hoping that the stars align and that what they like to publish is your book. Your editor then sort of works as a project manager on your book for the life of the book. And so uh, the, each editor works a little differently. There are some editors who um, accept a query, get the manuscript, send back edits, get the edits back, communicate with the author about the different things down the line, um, that's a relationship. There are some editors and authors who are like texting each other all the time, right? And so it's, this is a people business. The, the, your connection with your people, and I've heard editors that say, 
Um, I have some relationships with my authors where we're texting all the time, and I have some relationships with my authors where they're like, here's the book, and I'm like, cool, cool, right? And so it sort of depends on the, on the person um, and the style, right? They're like, we, for Uncultured, um, oh gosh, I loved working with Hannah. So we had three or four chapters kind of done. Um, and then we had to write the rest, and we had a really fast time period, right? Like it sold in March, and uh, we had to deliver September 1. And so we worked very unusually. Uh, uh, we had a little conveyor belt where it would, uh, we would write it, so Daniela would work on it, it would go to me. Uh, Amy Reed is the third writer on the book. She uh, writes YA um, fiction uh, specifically about trauma. And so she heightened the scenes where, um, that are essentially trigger warnings, um, so it would go to Amy, and then it would come back to me, and then it would go to Daniela, and then we'd send it to Hannah. Um, and that would happen chapter by chapter. Hannah would work on, um, on the chapter we had sent her, and they would go back through the conveyor belt again. Um, and so we were writing a chapter and editing a chapter kind of simultaneously. Um, and then we delivered August 1st, because we're awesome. Um, and we, sh Hannah took it into a Google Doc. Um, and which, I mean, it was quite a book to be in Google. Um, and then all of us just went to town on it simultaneously. That's a really unusual process, right? Um, and it was so fun, right? And it made the book, her edits made the book really what it is, right? Like all of us coming together. And so the editor, um, what their function is, they're, they're going to acquire the book. They're going to make sure that it hits all of the dates that it needs to hit. Um, they are going to um, be the person who's sort of project managing until about six weeks before the book comes out and then marketing and publicity comes in. They're different people. And so they're doing their thing to make sure that the book is out in the world. The editor's role is to make sure the book gets to the world in the, and has the editorial vision for it. Does that answer how, how editors work? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so the question is, um, how much will your work change and who has the final say? You have to pick what hills you're going to die on. Um, so it's not just your editor who has the final say. So for example, with Uncultured, um, the, uh, uh, the military had the final say on, uh, like we had to, um, the rule was is that it had to be, it had to have a military review. And so there were two words that the, that the Army said, um, we can't include. And so um, Daniela was really unhappy about those two words, because she's like, they're on Wikipedia. And I'm like, we're not putting those words in the book. Like, we're done. Like, we're not having, because um, they had the right to um, pull the book from publication based off of a contract she had signed when she was a vet. Um, and so there's some things that are like, totally not on, like, that's the government, right? Like, you can't. Um, you and your editor will have the kind of relationship where it, it um, where it depends, right? So things you don't have control over, what your cover looks like, what your package looks like, what your typesetting, like the interiors, like that's out of your control. It's not the hill you want to die on, I promise you. I can go into long, long reasons why. Uh, but there's a team who like understands how this stuff works and they're working with your sales team and your editor has already gone to bat for you like a lot, a lot, a lot. Don't die on this hill. Um, and you don't, you're not selling the packaging of the book. That's what you, the rights you sold to your publishing company. Um, I didn't see the Australian version of Uncultured until it showed up uh, published on my doorstep. I'm like, cool, all right. Oh, I, I, I. Um, and so um, in terms of the editorial, ideally, like, it's a relationship, right? I keep talking about connection. I keep, keep talking about community. We're not antagonistic. You might have really good, thoughtful, disagreements, but you're in relationship. Your agent will help you broker if you're like, I want this and she wants this and we're really far apart, right? But for the most part, you're in conversation, right? Um, any other questions? Here are some resources um, that can help you, your very favorite library. I mentioned Publishers Marketplace, PW, uh, which is called Publishers Weekly, is the magazine that we all read. Uh, Lit Hub is lovely. Uh, if you're writing on the children's side, we need diverse books. Um, 
uh, Twitter, Facebook groups, Instagram, if you're still on Twitter. Um, some hashtags that are super fun, MSWL, Manuscript Wanted List, so agents uh, and editors are like, man, I would love. And so I, I'll say this um, on behalf of Erin. She is looking for um, made but with healthcare. So if anyone has that, I, I know a woman, um, right? Because they, they're, and so Manuscript Wanted List is essentially, like it's, it's them asking for more. PitMad is a, um, is something as well. I told you about Query Tracker. If you have a contract in hand, you can join the Authors Guild. They'll do a legal review for free. They're going to give you the most stringent guidelines of that contract, so know that when you're going into it. Um, but they're, um, they're good. It was just NaNoWriMo. Um, and of course, your writing group are, are people who can help you. I'm also available for help. You've got my um, Instagram or well, Instagram, all my socials and my website. Um, please contact please contact me. So yeah. Thank you all very much. Really appreciate you being here.